is we will uh, get to um, uh, the Bool program. Why? Because that's the uh, program that we use uh, in connection with chapters three and four. We can use it and we'll use it for other chapters, but it's specifically uh, coming to the fore now as we are moving into chapter three. Um, but before we get to that, what I'd like to do is uh, revisit, just as a quick overview, what we chatted about on Tuesday, and then uh, move into material uh, that is uh, the substance of uh, chapter three and chapter four. We're kind of going to work a bit of an overview. Um, we're going to work largely by way of uh, you uh, coming to realize that you have a pretty good grasp of the uh, material, even if you might not know some technical features. And then once you have that realization, then we'll talk about the, the technical features. So where are we going? Well, we're looking at building on atomic or simple sentences, right? So we already know the notation that we use for an atomic sentence. We've been looking at this, the following scheme. We have a predicate, the first letter of which is capitalized, and then we have one or more constants depending on the type of predicate that we've got, right? Um, and we've also, so we can take that scheme and we can apply it to any number of sentences that, for example, don't appear in Tarski's world, that is the blocks language, right? Or that we wouldn't um, uh, see in uh, Fitch also using the, the blocks language. So, so let me try uh, an example. Um, and, and I'm gonna toggle between uh, sentences that we know to be true uh, or know to be false and sentences whose truth values we don't know, right? So if we look around the room and then uh, we'll, we'll just pick on Daniel and we'll pick on Connor um, and say, okay, everybody stare at Daniel, everybody stare at Connor. What do we notice? Well, we notice uh, that uh, Daniel wears a hoodie. That's one sentence. Atomic sentence, right? Uh, we know that an atomic sentence is the most basic or the smallest linguistic entity that has a truth value. Another way that we can talk about an atomic sentence is an atomic sentence doesn't have a connective. Um, the connectives that we're uh, going to embark upon in chapter three will get more in chapter seven, but the fundamental uh, connectives are negation, conjunction, disjunction. You might say, fine me, I know you're saying this, but this doesn't make sense, we haven't seen them before, so your definition of an atomic sentence as a sentence that doesn't have a connective is not very helpful. So let's just stick with smallest linguistic entity that has a truth value or the most basic sentence, right? So we've got Daniel wears a hoodie, we've got Connor wears a hoodie. Now we have not come across uh, the predicate phrase, wears a hoodie before. So I'm going to ask you, given your understanding of the scheme of notation that we've learned, how do you want to deal with uh, Daniel wears a hoodie, Connor wears a hoodie, more specifically, how do you want to deal with the predicate wears a hoodie? Connor, what do you so want to say? So you do wears, and then parentheses, Daniel, comma, hoodie. Oh, really good. That you, it's really good that you've said that. So, so I'm not going to write that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to write where's because that's, that's a great start. So did everybody hear what Connor said? He said where's, capital W, where's, open parenthesis, Connor, comma, hoodie, close parenthesis. Now, here's the problem with hoodie. Mm -hmm. Hoodie is not a name. Right? We're not saying this hoodie or that hoodie, right? Hoodie is what we're saying about Connor, namely uh, uh, Connor's uh, a hoodie wearer. Yeah? So we don't have a name of a hoodie, so it can't be an individual constant. Okay. I'm so glad you said that. Awesome. Remember, the more we articulate this stuff, 
the clearer uh, we get about what confuses us and what the, the solution is to that confusion. Uh, Kyle, what are you thinking? Uh, so would it be where it's hoodie and then parentheses, Daniel or Connor, depending? Okay. Close parentheses? So if you want, sure. I mean, here's the thing. That formulation of the predicate is a convention. It follows the scheme right, that we've been learning, the notational scheme that we've been learning. But you could say really whatever you want. I mean, you could say uh, hoodie wearer, oh. right? I mean, it really doesn't matter. But let, let's stick with yours, yeah. right? So uh, here we've got Daniel, which I can spell. Um, and here would also be Daniel. But again, we've decided that, that we want to use this one. Okay, so we've got uh, Daniel wears a hoodie. Um, and then we also have, uh, we'll check mark this, wears hoodie, and then lowercase Connor. Right, so far so good? So we've got this uh, scheme. Now we look at uh, each one of them. And we can make out of each simple or atomic sentence a compound sentence. How about this? Both Daniel and Connor wear hoodies. Now you've got the constituents of this particular sentence, right? You've got the atomic sentence for each. The question is, how do we notate the conjunction, right? We notate the conjunction, and here again, we're learning the notation for our version of the system we're learning with uh, a caret. So we're going to end up with our uh, two atomics, and they are going to be sandwiched, or sorry, rephrase, they sandwich the uh, conjunction. So we get, where's hoodie Daniel, oops, Daniel, and where's hoodie Kyle, what are you thinking? Um, wouldn't we be able to shorten it to where's hoodie, parentheses, Daniel, comma, no, just not, no, uh, uh, not comma, but just Daniel and sign, uh, and then close parentheses? So as a matter of the, the scheme that we've got so far, the, the rule for notation is the predicate is out to the left of a parenthetical within which is one or more individual constants mm. and is a connective okay. so it doesn't go in. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Okay. In other words, if you want to do what you're proposing, we, we need another uh, notational system. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, I don't know about you, but uh, this is a lot to look at, and I'm not saying that we won't use the... Uh, uh, predicate uh, language here. But you know what else we could do is this. We could use a capital D for Daniel wears a hoodie and then a capital C for Connor wears a hoodie. And in fact, we're going to toggle back and forth. You'll see this very clearly when we're in Bool. Uh, we're going to toggle back and forth between the uh, uh, predicate language that uh, we see exhibited in the blocks language of Tarski's world. It also appears in Fitch. It'll also appear in Bool. And capital letters A through Z that also stand for atomic or simple sentences. So here the, the visual is, uh, is cleaner, if you will. I mean, really what we're after, and, and we've said this before, is we're after our notation from the, sorry, rephrase. Really what we're after is notation that reveals the logical structure of our language rather than getting sort of lost in the letters and various words of, you know, ordinary language. 
okay? All right, so we've got these uh, two guys. Now, one other uh, note to make, uh, just file this away. This will come up later. I asked you to come up with a, a predicate, right, for the, uh, uh, to, to stand for uh, where's a hoodie. Um, and I asked you to use the scheme we already know because, um, for, for two reasons. One is that uh, we can take you know, any sentence we want, and as long as we are consistent in maintaining the notation, right, um, we don't have to uh, stick with um, what we see. In other words, I could, for example, decide that this is too complicated, I feel like this is too simple, I'm going to do this, I'm going to write W H D with no parenthetical conjunction W H C no parenthetical. Right. The key here is that the notation we use is uh, consistent. Why? Well, here's one reason. Again, file this away. When you're dealing with an argument and you have, let's say, uh, a couple of iterations in the argument of the sentence, Daniel wears a hoodie, you want your notation consistent so that you don't have, you know, wears hoodie Daniel in one iteration and a hoodie in another iteration. It's got to be the same throughout. Okay, so far so good. Um, all right, now let me ask you, uh, given uh, what we have just put on the, the board, and I'm going to erase uh, this guy, and I'm going to erase this guy. What if I now add uh, to the, the uh, scheme that we have uh, the following? What if I add, uh, it is not the case that uh, Connor wears shorts. So here's the simple sentence. Oops, this marker doesn't work all that well. Here's a simple sentence. Connor wears shorts. All right, so that we could uh, we could symbolize in what way? How do you want to do it? What do you think in Natalia? Oh, just the simple sentence. Yeah, I know I asserted a compound, I'm, and I apologize that I, I, I should have started with the simple, but we're going to notate it's not the case that. But for right now, how do you want to deal with Connor wears shorts? Now remember, C stands for Connor wears a hoodie. What are you thinking, um, uh, Sophia? For this exercise, yeah, I'd like you to uh, uh, not allow somebody who uh, doesn't know what these letters stand for to confuse C with Connor wears shorts. Yeah, okay. So we've got S for uh, Connor, Connor wears shorts. So S, D, C. Now... Come back to Natalia, I said, um, how can we articulate the sentence? It's not the case that Connor wears shorts. Well, and I'm just going to put it uh, down here. We've got uh, the hook. In some uh, versions of the system, you'll get a, a tilde symbol, right? It looks like this. It doesn't, again, it doesn't matter what the symbol is. What matters is that we have a symbol for the connective. In some uh, versions of the system, these symbols are called operators. Uh, in, in our text, the, the, both the name of the connective uh, as well as the symbol uh, are the same. In other words, this is negation, this is negation. Uh, it's also, the symbol itself is called a hook if you come across that or a tilde if you come across that. I'm going to erase the tilde because we don't use it. All right, so here's what I hope we're starting to see. Let's get a definition up here. 
a compound sentence consists of at least one predicate and well, actually I'm going to take the um, open paren away and the relevant number of constants and at least one connective. And we begin with the most fundamental connectives, negation, conjunction, and disjunction. All right, so I recognize that the um, monitors might be in the way. Uh, I hope the sentence otherwise is legible. So a compound sentence consists of at least one predicate and the relevant number of constants and at least one connective. So we've got negation and conjunction. We'll get to disjunction in, in a moment. The question for you, uh, how are we doing so far? Does it make more sense now in retrospect uh, to say that an atomic sentence doesn't involve a connective? Right? So we're going to start out with three connectives, and then we'll see when we get to chapter 7 that there are two more, and those are, are really built out of combinations of the three that we're focusing on today. So how do we read these guys? We read them uh, in the following way. Our conjunction, and as we'll see, our disjunction, uh, always go between uh, two sentences. And then the negation always goes to the left or out front of whatever is negated. Right, so far, so good. Um, so now let's make another uh, sentence combination. What if I say, so, so we already remember that, I hope, that uh, this is it's not the case that uh, Connor wears uh, shorts. And then how about this? Um, it's not the case that Connor wears shorts. <coughs> But, I think this is not lucky still, but Brompton does. Okay, I'm going to erase our initial notation. So, isn't it the case that we have two simple sentences, right? We have the sentence... Connor wears shorts, and the sentence Rompton wears shorts. We've already got C, or no, sorry, sorry. We've already got S for Connor wears shorts. Uh, we, how about R for Rompton wears shorts? Okay. Um, question for you, how many connectives are involved here? We've, we've just begun looking at uh, uh, negation and conjunction. Uh, Natalia's holding up two fingers. I thought I heard somebody yes saying two. Good. What are they? Negation and conjunction. Yeah. Negation. And which word is the conjunction? But. Yeah, good for you. Now, we'll see as we go forward. We're not going to make a big stink about it now. That there uh, are multiple English language words that we translate with the uh, connective conjunction. Okay, um, so for example, we've got both and, we've got and, we've got but, yet, nevertheless, moreover. The idea is for us to see how these connectives uh, work in our um, rephrase. We want to see how we can understand our language in terms of these connectives. So the focus is on connectives as essentially joints or hinges 
more on that in a little bit. All right, so how do you think we're going to write this? We know that negation takes this little hook, conjunction takes the caret, right? How do you think we're going to write this? And we know also that uh, we put uh, our two atomic or simple sentences on either side of the conjunction. So what do you think we should do? How do you want to write this, Natalia? Awesome. Okay, so it's not the case that S and R. Okay. Two things, um, we'll, we'll get to them, but just let me mention them now. We want to understand the conditions under which the sentence uh, is true and the conditions under which the sentence is false. That's one of the things that we're going to work on uh, today. In other words, even though I took sentences uh, that I said were true, so I, you know, I'm staring at Daniel, I'm staring at Connor, staring at Ronton, and I make sentences that uh, I believe correspond with the, the state of affairs, um, we are going to see that you know, we don't have access always to a world, a Tarski's world. So what we want in, uh, to do is to understand uh, truth um, in terms of possible worlds, more specifically here, I hope this language will make sense as we go forward, we're going to think about truth as a function of what S could be, true or false, what R could be, true or false, and the meanings of the connectives, right? Um, so, so this notion of truth functionality is going to be uh, at the core of the work that we're undertaking. And it's also going to be ultimately at the core of the, of the work we do in chapters 6 and 8. Um, in other words, we're going to see that understanding what makes a sentence true when that sentence is governed by negation, what makes that sentence false when it's governed by negation, what makes a conjunction sentence true or false, what makes a disjunction sentence true or false, is going to inform how we proceed. Uh, in fact, it's going to rule how we proceed through a derivation. So I know that's a lot of concepts that I'm throwing out at you, but I hope that as we get there, you'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it. All right, so um, the other point that I want to mention is, the, and it's related to what I just said about truth functionality, is the, the scope of the negation. Does it make sense to say that even if we don't understand this sentence, right, so we've worked on translating, but now I just want to focus on the notation. Is it fair to say that this negation covers S alone? Okay, so some people are going yeah and some people are going no. Good, awesome. So I'm going to try another sentence and then let's see for those of you who are feeling comfortable talking about it, whether you're comfortable talking about what confuses you or you're comfortable with the concept, let's uh, try this. So here's an, a new sentence altogether. Uh, not both um, Andrew and, it is Andrew, right? Oh. It's not Andrew. Omar. I keep confusing Omar. Yeah, Andrew... A lot of similarities, eyes, uh, beard, uh, uh, dark hair, sits over there in the last class I see, so I apologize. So not both uh, Omar and Sophia wear, let me, let me uh, make the sentence slightly different, are wearing caps. Now, we haven't seen the sentence, Omar wears a cap before. We haven't seen the sentence, uh, Sophia wears a cap before. Uh, are you pretty comfortable with realizing we don't have to, like we did with the Connor sentences? We don't have to, to, to uh, uh, make something new to distinguish the two atomic sentences from previous sentences involving Omar and Sophia. We can just say, O for Omar, S for Sophia. Okay, now... What is your intellectual gut telling you 
about the phrase, not both, and the phrase, you know, both and. What are you thinking? Sophia. Go for it. Okay, you're, well, here's the thing uh, that, that I've noticed. I mean, I, 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 this is all anecdotal, but a sentence that begins with not both in, uh, oh, sorry, let me back out of that. A lot of people will translate a not both with the disjunction. And there's nothing wrong with that logically, provided that your translation is equivalent. More on that later. So let me ask you this. Can you, are you willing to say how you'd want to write the, uh, we won't do it yet, but how you'd want to write the sentence as an or sentence? It's a, it's going to be a capital V basically. Okay. Yeah. Called a wedge, but. It is, or, yep. Okay, so that would be O and the wedge would Okay, now the only thing you're missing in terms of equivalence would be uh, negations in the relevant places. But, but the re I'm glad you said what you said because, as I just mentioned, we sometimes um, convert uh, notation because w for whatever reason, we read the sentence not as a conjunction but as a disjunction. And that's okay under certain, as long as certain requirements are met. Okay. Uh, so anybody comfortable reading this with the with the conjunction, and how would you notate this? What are you thinking? Okay. So right now, so let me back out. Remember, the question that I had for you was, does it make sense to you to say that this negation belongs with, covers the S? And some of you said no, and some of you said yes. In other words, the scope of this negation is restricted to S. And then I offered this sentence, not both. Right now, what, what Natalia's written is really close to the... Uh, exacting translation, the accurate translation, but right now what she's got is, it's not the case that Omar wears a cap, but Sophia does. So what do you think we might need so that we can say that this negation actually doesn't cover exclusively the O, but really is rejecting the both? Notice that what's being rejected is both. What do you think we could do? Parentheses. Um, oh, oh. Not Elizabeth. Evelyn. I had the E part right. Sorry, Evelyn. Evelyn, were you going after the parentheses? Good. All right. So we put parentheses here to tell us that this compound sentence is being treated as a unit, the whole of which is negated. All right, now let's uh, push on what Sophia was, was saying earlier. Um, she thinks of the not both in terms of the disjunction. And I'm going to share with you an equivalence, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Then we're going to move on to talk more about the disjunction. And then let's pull some technical language together. Okay. So uh, some of you are going to go, yay, and some of you are going to say, oh, when I say that this sentence is truth functionally equivalent to, or is a tautological equivalence of, that's more technical language, the following sentence. And I'm just putting four dots here to represent uh, equivalence. Not O or not S. And this is the OR symbol. The disjunction. Sophia, what are you thinking? Yes. The, well, now, because we use the word uh, identity specifically uh, for a symbol, 
let's say rather these two sentences are logically equivalent. A more technical term would be these two sentences are truth functionally equivalent. That's, that doesn't make any sense to you yet because conceivably, because we haven't talked about truth functionality in a, in a detailed way. But, I, but, but I'm going to use the language and then we'll, we'll get used to it. Mohammed, what are you thinking? I'm confused because isn't there a Um, that's our kind of colloquial way of, of thinking about it, and it's related, I believe, I mean, I'm not, not a linguist, but, I, but it's related, I believe, to uh, the way that we think about a disjunction. So let me try this, right, uh, and then see if it helps you at all. I'm going to try another example that might help you as well. And if neither one does, you'll say so. Okay. So... For those of you who are comfortable thinking about distribution, is it fair to say that this negation gets distributed to each of the atomic sentences when we remove the parentheses? Now, that's the key to maintaining equivalence in terms of the way we just speak in ordinary language. The other thing that happens, and it goes both ways, the other thing that happens is the conjunction is replaced with the disjunction. Or if we start here, the disjunction is replaced with the conjunction. So here's how we can read it. Not both, which is to say either one or the other is not, we just don't know which one's not. We we're preserving the, the negation. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me try uh, another sentence, and then let's see uh, what we think about this one. Uh, what if I say, um, and are you guys comfortable with me erasing this stuff here? All right. What if I say, uh, let's see. Neither Evelyn nor Janet is wearing a blue shirt. So the atomic sentence is Evelyn is wearing a blue shirt. The atomic sentence is Janet is wearing a blue shirt, right? And so how about this for the notation? E for Evelyn is wearing a blue shirt. J for Janet is wearing a blue shirt, okay? And then I say, neither, nor. That's what I'm going to want to articulate here. Okay. So uh, let's try it this way. Based on the first example where the negation was rejecting the conjunction, does it make sense to say that this n in the neither is a negation that's rejecting the disjunction? Not one or the other, neither. Some people are like, okay. Some people are like, I'm not sure. Well, try it this way and then we'll, we'll, we'll try it another way. It's not the case that one or the other wears a blue shirt. So here again, we're rejecting the or, we're rejecting the unit. Now, when I say we're, we're rejecting the unit, here's uh, what I'm, what I'm, what I'd like to say, and then we'll come back to, uh, and, and then we'll we'll work on this more in a little bit. Is it fair to say that if we didn't have the negation there? This would be an or sentence, one or the other, right? When we say neither one, right, it's not, it's not the case that either one wears blue, right? So neither one, I'm rejecting that disjunction. Be okay with that? Now, here's another equivalence.
neither one nor the other tells us both are not. Sorry, I'm making both are not. Okay, now we just covered a whole lot of ground in terms of some basic features of, of translation. So, so one of the things that we want to do is now uh, back up, do a bit of a rewind over the, the territory we've just covered and make sure that we're comfortable with uh, the, the, the building blocks here. Uh, but before we do that, really quickly, um, does it make sense to you to say, given that we started with the neither, that we push to the negation through here and the conjun or sorry, the disjunction becomes a conjunction. Okay. Um, and now let's just very quickly put this in some terms that might resonate better uh, uh, for you. So I'm thinking, Muhammad, of the, the nice confusion that you articulated earlier. So somebody tell me what your bag, your deal, your thing is. Like who's super into sports? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> uh, oh gosh, I'll let's be see. Into sports. How about what? Brompton what? I'll be into sports. So, okay, you'll be into sports. <laughs> yeah, but it's got to be something that like resonates with us. Yeah, um, I like basketball. Yeah. Basketball. Yeah, I like basketball. Okay, so uh, let's see. The um, shoot, who is it that's up in San Francisco? What team is that? The Warriors. Oh, yeah. yeah. Warriors are in, and then uh, Lakers. Okay. Okay. So, um, who won? I was about to say World Series. Who won the the last NBA championship? The Warriors. The Warriors. Okay. So if I say not both the Warriors and the Lakers won the NBA championships this year. Right? So, not both the Warriors and the Lakers won the NBA championships this year, right? You would be comfortable saying, okay, it's not the case, parenthesis, open parenthesis, W, conjunction, L, close parenthesis. Not both of them won it which is to say either one did not or the other did not, pushing on Muhammad the preserving of the negation, right? It's not the case that Warriors, or it's not the case that Lakers, okay? Uh, two more teams, how what? Uh, how about the what? Uh, who, who, was, who were the Warriors playing? The Cavaliers? Cavaliers. Okay, so neither Cavaliers, nor the self. What did you pick? Oh, you're saying something else. The Celtics won the NBA championships. So neither one tells us. Neither C nor uh oh. Can't have C again because then we won't be able to tell the difference. Let's pick another letter. L. L, right? For Celtic, sure. I mean, it can be whatever we want as long as we're consistent throughout. Neither one of them won, which is to say it's not the case that the Cavs won and it's not the case that the Celtics won. So, question for you the whole the whole point, ostensibly, of introducing what we will learn are uh, called De Morgan's equivalences uh, was to help us understand uh, the scope of the negation. But we, we accomplished some other stuff, too. But I want to make sure that, that you got what the point of it is. Right? So don't worry about knowing these equivalences. That's not what we're after for the moment. Right? What are we after right now? We're after understanding. So, so here's 
So let's let's take a, a pause here, sort of an intermission, um, and say the whole point right now is that we understand how we can notate compound sentences, which means we need to know what a compound sentence is, right? We know that a compound sentence can, consists of uh, at least one uh, uh, predicate and relevant individual constant, if we're using the predicate language, or capital letter A through Z, right? So at least one atomic sentence and at least one connective, right? So a compound sentence, I'm just trying to say two things at once. A compound sentence is constituted by at least one atomic sentence and at least one connective. Now, so we've got that. We're good. We're good. We also know, although I'm not going to worry about this too much because we'll get back to translations and the peculiarities of uh, uh, parentheses and so much and so forth. And I don't mean peculiarities in any way other than just uh, making sure that we understand uh, when we use parentheses and when we don't. The, what we want to be able to do now is say, okay, how do I know when a sentence governed by negation, conjunction, or disjunction is true and when it's false? Okay, so that's our next project. So uh, with your approval or acquiescence, I'm going to erase I just need one nod and then I'm good. So unless you shout out, I will. I will don't do it, Neil. I'm going to erase. Okay, so. Truth definitions of connectives. We want to know when a sentence governed by one of the connectives is true and when it is false. Now we're coming to uh, some of the technical language that uh, I mentioned a little bit ago. In other words, we're going to see that in uh, Boolean logic, um, in the logic, or sorry, rephrase, in propositional or sentential logic, which is what we're working on now, truth is a function of, or truth is determined by, Po the possible values of your atomic sentence sentences in combination with what a connective means. Okay. And the good news is you already know all of this stuff. You just may not realize you know it, right? Um, so fair or sorry, so, so let's go back to uh, a sentence we had earlier. Uh, the sentence, uh, Daniel wears a hoodie. You know, we stare at Daniel, we see that sentence is true, right? But I want us to focus not on what we say we know is the case, that is what we say uh, we know is true because we could stare at Daniel, right? Or we can look at Atarsky's world. Uh, I'm going to offer you a sentence, uh, the truth value of which you don't know. So how about this one? Joe has spots. I'm going to draw a line under that sentence, and then I'm going to write a capital T and a capital F, and I'm going to say this sentence, Joe has spots, is either true or false. Are you comfortable with that? Now, I know that what we want, what we, what we tend to be really uncomfortable with uh, is what we want, rather. Uh, sorry, let me start the sentence. 
I know that what we want is the truth. Tell me the truth. I want the answer, right? Um, we're uncomfortable with, well, could be true, could be false, ah, no, no, no. right? We're, that we're not comfortable with, but you will be. In other words, you're going to be comfortable with possible truth values. Okay. So our job is not to know the uh, actual value of the sentence, Joe has spots. Okay. Question for you. The sentence, Joe has spots, is true or false? If I say, it's not the case that Joe has spots, how can I make sense of the truth values there? So let me write this out. So it's not the case that Joe has spots. Yeah. All right, if it's true that Joe has spots, when I claim it's not the case that Joe has spots, you'll say that sentence is false. So it's not the case that is a false sentence. All right, so... Uh, Suppose that I know it's true that Joe has spots, you know, but I lie to you. My lie is to assert the false sentence. It's not the case that Joe has spots. Seriously. No, no. Right? So the negation functions as a rejection of whatever the value is of the sentence that's being rejected, that's being negated. If Joe has spots is a false sentence, it's not the case that Joe has spots is true. true. Good. Okay, so now you know the truth definition for negation. So let me go ahead and, and put it on the, the board. Um, but I, what I'd like to do is erase this first. Uh, let me know if you're comfortable with me erasing it. All right, so... I'm interested in the possible values of any sentence in the universe governed by negation. So I'm going to use a P for just placeholder sentence, right? Placeholder sentence is either true or false. Negation, placeholder sentence, right? So it's not the case that true. Not true is false. It's not the case that false. Not false is true. So negation is defined according to the original values, right, and the function of the negation. The truth is a function of the negation working on the sentence it negates, okay? And I know that feeling like you're kind of going back and forth with T's and F's can be a little bit confusing and overwhelming, but don't forget the mantra. If Mia can do it, I can do it. Okay, so, um, sorry, there was something I was thinking I want. I do want to grab it before moving on. What was it? <laughs> what was I thinking? Well, I, I'm not going to worry about it. I don't want to waste your time. Um, so any sentence that, that, yeah, the, sorry, that was what I wanted to say. I just was going to go about it a different way. Any sentence that has negation as its main connective is going to have these as their definitions. What do I mean by that? Well, let's let's try uh, the following. So uh, we had uh, Connor doesn't wear shorts, but 
Rumton does, right? Remember that? So let's do this. So here's the uh, sentence. It's not the case that Connor wears shorts, right? Now, we all look at Connor and we see that the atomic sentence, Connor wears shorts, is true or false? false. It's false, which means that the sentence, it's not the case that Connor wears shorts, is true. That's what we're after because this sentence is governed by the negation. Yeah? Okay. So we've calculated or determined the truth value of this sentence by applying the definition, the relevant definition of negation. All right, you ready for another one? Okay, how about this? Uh, I look around the room, I see Matthew wears a baseball cap, I see Omar wears a baseball cap, oh sorry, Miguel is, we used Omar earlier, let's, let's use two different names. So Matthew, Miguel, oh no, two M's. We could say M and I, or what, you know, whatever, it doesn't really matter, but I'm gonna do this verbally, so there's a lot to hold in mind, then we'll put stuff on the board. Okay, so I look at Matthew, it's true that Matthew is wearing a baseball cap, it's true that Miguel is wearing a baseball cap. So the sentence, Matthew and Miguel wear baseball caps, is true or false? Mm -hmm. True. Okay. Now, and, and if you don't want to do this, just tell me. Uh, uh, keep your baseball cap on, Matthew. Miguel, do you mind taking yours off? Okay. All right. It's true that Matthew's wearing a baseball cap. It's false that Miguel's wearing a baseball cap. Is it true that Matthew and Miguel wear baseball caps? Okay. Okay. So we have true, 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 false. Now, everybody stare at Matthew. Matthew is wearing a baseball cap. True or false? False. False. Miguel's wearing a baseball cap. True or false? True. False. True. So if it's false that Matthew wears a cap, it's false that Miguel, or sorry, true that Miguel wears a cap. Is it true or false that both wear caps? False. 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 And then keep it off one more time. It's false that Matthew wears a cap. It's false that Miguel wears a cap. Is it true or false that both wear a cap? False. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. So here's how conjunction works. And P.S. Did you notice there were four possible scenarios, four possible worlds, four possible uh, permutations of T's and F's? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, bring to the for a reference column that has, uh, again, placeholder P, placeholder Q. These are just kind of your standard placeholders in, in propositional logic. And what did we say? It was true and true, true and false, false and true, and then false and false. And these reference values are going to hold for conjunction and disjunction. So, so hold on to that. All right, so we said that, and here's a definition. A conjunction is true when and only when each of the conjuncts is true. Remember Matthew and Miguel wearing and not wearing hats? Or the T's and the F's involved? So we have true, false, False, false. And I'm just highlighting that T because this is the one and only one time that the conjunction is true. This is what defines the conjunction. The conjunction is true when and only when each of the conjuncts is true. When one is true and the other is false, the sentence is false. When one is false, the other is true, the conjunction is false. And when each is false, the conjunction is false. How many of you go, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm all right. How many of you go, I'm not okay? And, it's, and, and there's no uh, right answer. We had, so for example, in another uh, section, somebody said, wait a second, and this person codes. Uh, this person said, wait a second, shouldn't false, false be true because they're equivalent values? Short answer is no, and, and the longer answer is, uh, we will have an equivalence um, symbol where two falses make a true for that for that connected. That's going to be 
uh, chapter 7. And we don't want conjunction to say the same thing as that symbol because they don't say the same. So we don't want to make them. But also, let's just think about what you already know. Okay? If it's false that Andrew wears a baseball cap, it's false that Kevin wears a baseball cap, is it true or false that both wear a baseball cap? False. Right. So we don't believe when we think of the meaning of conjunction, right? The demand of the conjunction is that each conjunct has to be true. When each conjunct is false, or when just one conjunct is false, the sentence as a whole is false. So these are our definitions. All right, so let's go back now to that sentence we talked about earlier. Uh, it's not the case that Connor wears shorts, but... Brompton does. All right, question for you. Now that you have uh, an inkling, at least, of the scope of the negation, right, what are you going to say drives or governs this connective, or this sentence? In other words, is this sentence a not sentence or an and sentence? It's an and, right? It, this sentence says, it's not the case and, this or both this and that where this is a not sentence all right so that means that we determine our conjunction last now we already know that the sentence uh sorry i just put the wrong value we know that the sentence connor wear shorts is false right so we're not doing possible values we're implementing the definition we know that Connor wears shorts is false, which means that it's not the case Connor wears shorts. Connor wears shorts is true. Do we know that it's true or false that Brompton wears shorts? We're staring at him right now. It's true. Oh no, I'm gonna do that. It's true. So true and true by way of the conjunction is true and true. Oh, because he doesn't, right. Right, 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 right. Yeah, 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 there you go. Good job. So we have used our truth definitions of the conjunction to make sense of a sentence where we were given the values of the atomic uh, constituents. What do we think? So far, so good? Last one, we've got the disjunction. Some of you are going to love it, some of you are going to hate some of it, but that's, well, or not, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> okay, um, remember Joe, and by the way, just, just so you know, it is true that Joe's just a little guy that needed somebody to love him. You still don't know anything about the spots part. Okay. All right, so uh, uh, we... Don't know whether or not it's true that that Joe has uh, spots, right? Okay. Now uh, I I have spots. I'll just make that so so. Uh, question for you: If it's true uh, that Nia wears spots, is it true or false that Nia or Joe wears spots? Is it true that I wear spots? Is it true or false that Nia or Joe wears spots? Yeah, you don't even know about Joe. This tells you something super important about the truth definitions for disjunction. Okay. It could be true, it could be false that Joe wears spots. As long as it's true that one of us does, the whole sentence is true. How many people go, yeah, okay, and how many people go, wait a second, just lost me here. What are you thinking, Sophia? I think it's true. What are you thinking should be, so we, we still need a fourth value here, by the way. False. Yeah, so false disjunction false is the one and only one case when the disjunction itself is false. Okay, we'll come back to that in a moment, but what are you thinking is, what's bugging you?
Okay, I think, tell me if I'm wrong, based on what you're saying, that you're using our kind of ordinary way of thinking about the or, right? You're, you're at a restaurant and uh, you're asked, do you want super salad? And the, you know, the, the assumption is that you get one and only one. In logic, unless you say that, it could be both. So here's the short story. In logic, the or is inclusive, which is to say, as long as Mia's wearing spots, right, it's true that Mia or somebody else wears spots. And that somebody else could be true, could be false. Right, so the, the disjunctions, uh, uh, constituent values, in other words, each of the disjuncts when they're true, don't stop the disjunction from being true. In, or, in uh, logic, the or is inclusive. It's uh, one or the other could be both. Whereas our shorthand in our, in our daily lives is when we say one or the other, we mean one or the other, but not both. We mean exclusivity. But unless you tell logic to say one or the other, uh, but not both, unless you mean exclusivity in a rephrase, unless you assert exclusivity, you get inclusivity. And that can be a little bit of a, of a, a confusion, but I hope that helps a little bit. All right, so here are our definitions, right? Negations, values are always the opposite of the sentence being negated. Conjunction is true when and only when each conjunct is true. Disjunction is false when and only when each disjunct, disjunct is false. What are we thinking? So far, so good? And some of you are like, yay, it's like a really fun machine. You just plug in the values and off you go, right? And some of you just are feeling overwhelmed by T's and F's and why do we have this many rows and that and all the rest of it. If you're in that latter camp, uh, don't worry. It, it, it is going to get better. But try, if you can, to articulate what bugs you, right? Because if, if there's something you're confused, even if you're not sure why you're confused, you know, if you start talking about uh, uh, how you're feeling mentally, um, things will start to, to make more sense. You'll get, if nothing else, clearer about what bugs you. So here's something that's super, super cool. Uh, <laughs> these three connectives are, you know, the the heart of uh, a system of logic uh, in which a huge variety of sentences can be built, right? Really complex arguments uh, can be uh, ultimately constructed out of just these three. So uh, we're going to use these connectives. This is just a, a file it away. This is going to happen. Uh, but these connectives are going to be uh, used in rules. They inform the rules that we use to make inferences in derivations, right? So even though we're not going to uh, use Fitch again for a little bit, when we come back to Fitch, we're going to uh, talk about these truth definitions again so that we can make sense of why the rules work the way they do, okay? So effectively, and this isn't like super exciting and sexy to, to think about when you're thinking about philosophy, you know, you know, we're not getting like the meaning of life here. What we're getting in, in this uh, uh, system is a way to assemble and disassemble sentences <laughs> based on their truth definitions, right? That's what we'll be doing in chapter six and eight, but it's super awesome. You're going to love it. Okay. How about some bool? What do you think? Do you want to start looking at that program a little bit? I'm going to need to erase our truth definitions. Uh, what I like to do is uh, have the truth definitions up so that we can refer to them. But let's hope that on Tuesday, 
um, the main projector will be back up. All right, so I'm in, can, can you see this okay? Okay, so Bool is the one program That's not opening. <laughs> la, 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 la. Oh, here it is. Okay, here we go. Bool is the one program that does not come with uh, pre given files, right? So we're now, I hope, comfortable with the idea that. When you're working in Tarski's world or Fitch, yeah, you can have uh, you can build stuff or make sentences, make arguments uh, in untitled windows. But you also are told by the textbook, "Hey, open this file, open that file, right?" And presumably, it will open for you. <laughs> um, in Bool, that's not the case. Everything everything is is, is uh, built from scratch. So, um, we've got a pretty narrow use for bool. That'll make sense as we go forward. For right now, all I care about is that you're comfortable kind of navigating around bool um, and building sentences. So, here's what you're seeing this vertical line separates the reference column from the sentences uh, window. So remember I had PQ um, on the board? Well, if you, and you can, I don't know if you can see it, but the cursor is here in the sentence window. If I click in the reference column window, and then let's suppose I'm using the bo blocks language, not A, B, C, D, and so forth, but I'm using the blocks language, and I say, uh, I want to create the sentence tet A, or A is a tet. I can do that, and then I can either build my sentences or suppose that I have a compound sentence that involves more than one atomic sentence, right? So, for example, I could just have tet A, and then I can go over to the sentence window, and I can use, I can either... Uh, use the keyboard or I can use the buttons to write negation tet a, right? I can do that. That's a compound sentence. But suppose that I have this sentence. I have, it's not the case that tet a or tet b. In that case, I need to have in my reference columns I need to have not just tet A, but I need to add another column. Whoops, sorry. Add another column after. So you could either use the drop down or you can use control commands, depending on what type of machine you use. And then you'll put, then you'll uh, use the buttons to put the sentence tet B in. Now, as an FYI, and we'll talk more about this later. Uh, as an FYI, you'll always use the same ordering of T's and F's. So do you remember when we had the uh, uh, conjunction and disjunction, we had four rows? The reference columns always had the following order. The first sentence, half true, half false. The second sentence alternated when we had a four row truth table. You can tell, and this is what's great about, one of the things that's great about uh, Bool, you can fill the reference columns, or you can tell Bool, sorry, hey, fill those reference columns for me. And it gives them to you, right? So we've got two sentences, four possible values. Why? Because the four possible truth values exhaust the configurations, the permutations. Now, if that doesn't make sense, don't worry. We, we still have to talk more about this. But the short story is uh, two atomic sentences yield four rows. These rows always lay out the same, half true, half false, and then we take 
half of the first two rows, and then we alternate. Okay, so Boole can set that up for you. Now you're in a position to work through the uh, actual determination or calculation of your possible truth values for this sentence. Now I can't make the, the this, there's not a, a way to scale the uh, increase in font so the columns get all wonky when I do this, unfortunately. But do you see this blob here at the bottom? This actually says one, okay? Uh, and this is uh, a way to alert you that this is the main connective or the main operator. This is an or sentence. This sentence says either not A is a tet or B is. Or either A is not a tet or B is. That would be the English language grammar. Now suppose that you wanted to start, so I clicked just, uh, I clicked in the column underneath the or, and notice, so suppose that you wanted to start by calculating these values. When you click under the or, this is really a nice thing that Boole does for us. It helps us learn about main connectives or main operators. Boole says, okay, this or is determined by the value of the atomic sentence B is a tet, which is highlighted, and the value of it's not the case that A is a tet. So basically, Boole is saying, hey, you've got to determine the negation first. Okay. So you come over to the negation, click in the column under negation, and you're told what your reference is. So what do we know? What's our definition for the negation? The negation's value is always opposite of the value the sentence, or sorry, rephrase. Negation's value is always the opposite of the value that it's negating, the sentence it's negating. So, not true is, not true is, not false is, true. not false is, and these never change, right? <laughs> Once you've got your definitions and you understand the order of uh, determinations, right? It's a, like a little grinding machine. All right, now we're in a position, I'm going to click under the disjunction. Now we can deal with the disjunction. What do we know about a disjunction's truth values? A disjunction is false when and only when each disjunct is false. So we've got one true. So the disjunction is? Both are false. So the disjunction is? True. 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 False. True. Sweet. All right, now, here's another way in which Boole is a nice aid for us to, to learn about truth definitions. Do you see this button? I don't know if you can tell what it says. It says assessment, right? Let's click on the button, and this window opens. You've got various uh, evaluations. We're going to start going over those uh, next week right, so that you can make sense of what they mean and uh, correspond, do the work the corresponding homeworks. Uh, in the meantime, notice uh, we've got the following, correct question mark, complete question mark. Let's verify the table, which is the button over here, the second button in the far right column, and notice that we get two check marks. When we get two check marks, we know that we have not only created a complete table, but it's also correct. Okay? So this is what you're going to want to mess around with a bit. Now, if you run into trouble with any of the homeworks because you're saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, we're still a little bit behind here, then do what you can, and then as soon as we've covered what we need to finish covering for the homeworks to be sort of legitimately demanded, then you can submit those. Sophia, what are you thinking? Do as much as you can by Sunday so that you're at least kind of on track. And then the stuff that 
we haven't covered yet, don't stress over that. Like, you can always mess around and see what you can figure out. Because don't forget, whatever files you submit that come back with a grade grinder report that says, oh, this didn't go well, you can always resubmit them. It's not like you're going to be penalized. Okay. All right, so we'll pick this up uh, on um, Tuesday. Um, Rongton, if you have a minute, let's. I want to address your question. And then, Janet, I know you have a, a question about the um, uh, programs.